All right, we've spent some time talking about estimator quality. So one of the things that we've just got done talking about is finding the actual minimum variance for certain sets of estimators. And well, we had very, very specific types of estimators and said, and then find a constant that would minimize the variance. So for our purposes, of course, in general, this is going to be a difficult thing to do of actually trying to figure out an estimator that has a variance that's as small as possible. So what this video is going to do is go through a proof of a way, an inequality, that will help us determine whether or not we have a a, the, an estimator that has a variance as small as possible. Now again, think about why you would want an estimator that has a variance as small as possible. You're using the estimate to estimate a, an, the estimator to estimate a population parameter. You would like the probability of that particular estimator being far away from the population parameter to be small, right? So the, the smaller the variance, the smaller the probability that the estimator is going to be far away. So that's why we want to use these uh, uh, estimators that have as small a variance as possible. All right, so those types of variance, those types of estimators, I mean, are called Uniform Minimum Variance Unbiased Estimators, or UMVUE. Now, ordinarily, I drop off the uniform part, and you'll see other textbooks drop off the uniform part and just call it a Minimum Variance Unbiased Estimator. And so theta hat will be a MVUE for theta. If for any other uh, estimator, XC hat, or like a friend of mine calls it tornado hat, we have that the variance of theta hat is less than or equal to the variance of tornado hat. So the variance of theta hat is as small as it can be for any other estimator. Okay. So another way to think about this is, of course, that if you think about uh, the expected value of theta hat minus theta squared, that would give you the variance of theta hat. So expected value of theta hat minus theta quantity squared. That's the definition of the variance of theta hat. That's also our definition of the mean square error. So theta hat is, a, and is, is an MVUE if it minimizes the mean square error. Okay. Or it gives you the least squares error. So there's another instance of where least squares pops up. All right, so as I mentioned leading off this video, it's hard to find MVUEs in general. So we're going to use this, what we refer to as the Kramer Rao or the Rao Kramer lower bound. And again, the order in which these names appear depends on which textbook you look at. I'm going to write Kramer Rao because C comes before R in the alphabet. All right, so let's talk about what this Kramer Rao inequality is. We start with a random sample. The PDF that the distribution has is uh, f of x, and of course it'll be in terms of some theta. Then we remember from maximum likelihood estimator stuff that we did earlier in the semester, we created the likelihood function by doing the product of the PDF for each of these x sub i's. Again, each of these x sub i's, the capital x sub i's, will have the exact same distribution. So basically we're just taking the PDF times itself n times, except that we're plugging in an x sub i at each stage. Okay, so to help us out here, we're going to assume that our likelihood function is differentiable, so our PDF is nice. As long as the PDF is nice and differentiable, certainly the product will, because we can do product rule things, and has a support free of theta. So what that means is you don't have something like the uh, example that we talked about with the uh, uniform distribution on 0 to theta. So that would not, the support would not be free of theta there because theta is in the interval from zero to theta. So we want a support for the random variable that has numbers essentially and no thetas in it. That's all that part means. Okay, so for any unbiased estimator theta hat of theta, it turns out that the variance of theta hat always has to be greater than or equal to this expression. So the reciprocal of the expected value of the square of the partial with respect to theta of the log of the likelihood function. It's a lot of words, okay? So this expression is what we're interested in, okay? And we'll actually have another way to write this expression here towards the end of the video. 
uh, that usually is used in practice. And we're going to do an example at the end. But I want to go through the proof because I think it uh, reminds us of some things as we go through this particular class. All right, so here's the proof. Okay, the likelihood function is the product of the PDFs. Well, each of these, that's the P, each of the X sub I's has the same PDF, just with a X sub I plugged in instead of an X. And they're all independent, so the joint probability density function is just the product of the PDF, so it's just the likelihood function. If we integrate or summate, we could do these with summations too. There's nothing special about the integral here, except that we usually deal with continuous distributions. It's the only reason why we've got integrals here. But if I integrate the PDF over the support, I get one. That's a basic concept that we learned last semester in probability, right? integrate a PDF, you get one. And the, the reason this is a PDF is because it's just the product of the individual pieces. All right, well, this has a theta in it, of course. If we went through this and went all the way through the theta, if I differentiate the left-hand side with respect to theta, well, I have to differentiate the right-hand side with respect to theta. There are no thetas, so that derivative is zero. So if I differentiate this integral expression, I get zero. Now here's where the support being free of theta is important. Since there's no thetas here, I get to take this derivative and move it inside. So I can take this partial with respect to theta and move it all the way inside to here. Okay, cool. All right, so now I'm gonna play a little algebra game here. I'm going to divide by the log likelihood function and I'm going or excuse me just the likelihood function sorry and then multiply by the likelihood function still have zero on the right hand side I haven't done anything here except cleverly rewrite one however I do recognize now this as the derivative of something it's one over the inside times the derivative of the inside that is the derivative of the log likelihood function okay so now I have this expression is equal to zero. Now if I multiply both sides by theta, put a theta out in front, I still have a zero. Okay. The reason why we multiplied this by theta will come into play later. And then of course, since it's the distribution, excuse me, the support is free of theta, this, as far as this integral is concerned, this theta is a constant, so I can pull it on the inside. So now I have this expression that I'm going to refer to by star, so keep that one in mind. All right. Now let's work with theta hat. Well, theta hat is an unbiased estimator for theta, so that means when I take the expected value of theta hat, I have to get theta. Well, by definition, the expected value of theta hat will be I take the theta hat and I multiply it by the PDF. This is how we do expected value. So this has, still has to be theta. Now guess what? I'm going to differentiate both sides again. Now when I take the derivative here, I get a 1 on the right-hand side instead of a 0. The support is free of theta, so I get to move this partial derivative inside to here. Theta hat doesn't have theta in it. Remember, we're trying to use theta hat to estimate theta. There better not be a theta in theta hat. It's really hard to estimate theta if there's a theta in it. So there's no, th there's no thetas in theta hat, so it pops out in front of the derivative as well. So now we have this, and we just saw on the last slide that we could rewrite this partial derivative as the partial of the log likelihood function times the likelihood function. And I'm gonna label this double star. All right, so now we have those two integrals. Let's subtract. Okay, so I subtract those two. Well, if I subtract those two, I can combine the integrands. This piece was in the integrand of both of them, so I can just factor it out. So I have theta hat minus theta. When we do this integral, we get one. Okay, now I'm gonna do something that looks really goofy. I'm going to square both sides. That's where this squared comes from. Of course, when I square one, I still get one, but Inside the integral, I'm going to rewrite the L of theta here as the square root of L of theta times the square root of L of theta. Okay, so this is where some linear algebra pops in. If you remember, well, if you've had me for linear algebra this semester, we've already done this before. 
But if you remember inner product spaces from linear algebra, you know that if you do the integral over an interval of a function times another function, so the integral of f times g over an interval, that defines an inner product, okay, for the function space. Usually you want to make sure things are continuous. Since the log likelihood function is differentiable, it's certainly continuous. So that, that integral of f times g over an interval, and you get to use any interval you want, so I can go from minus infinity to infinity, like I have here, that is a inner product over that particular vector space. One of the more famous inequalities that Pope pops up in inner product spaces is what's referred to as the Cauchy-Swartz inequality, which says that the absolute value of the inner product of two vectors is less than or equal to the magnitude of the two vectors. Okay, well this is the inner product of two vectors. It's this function times this function, and to not worry about absolute values, I would square. Okay, well in that case then that the, the, the uh, inner product of the two squared has to be less than or equal to the square of each individual, or the inner product of yeah, the magnitude of each of these, the squares of the magnitude of each of these. So the magnitude of each of these is just the integral of the function times itself. So I get theta hat minus theta squared times log likelihood function times the partial derivative of the log likelihood function squared times the likelihood. Okay? So when you basically what I'm saying is when you move the squared in, to the individual pieces and break it up as a product, it gets bigger. That's Cauchy-Swartz inequality, okay? And again, that all comes about by the fact that you've got the fact that you can define an inner product by doing the integral of the product of functions, okay? All right, so now, of course, the first part is the variance. This is exactly how variance is defined, right? It's expected value of theta hat minus theta squared. So this is theta hat minus theta squared times the PDF. So this is expected value of theta hat minus theta squared, which is the variance. The second part, this is expected value of this function. So the variance times this is greater than or equal to one. Hence we have the variance of theta hat has to be greater than or equal to that thing that we said at the beginning. So again, this is what's referred to as the Kramer-Rau inequality. This part, the right-hand side here, would be the lower bound. But let's talk about this bottom piece before we do an example. All right, so that expectation in the denominator usually is not, it's easier to compute it in a different way. So let's suppose that our likelihood function, we can actually differentiate it twice, okay? And let's look at the expected value of the second partial. Of course, the second partial is the partial of the first partial. And the, part, the first partial will be 1 over the inside times derivative of the inside. It's a log function. Now I have a product. Derivative of the first times the second, right? Negative, this is ne negative, log, uh, excuse me, negative likelihood function to the negative 1. So this is a chain rule. Negative likelihood function to the negative 2, derivative of the likelihood function. That's a chain rule. Times the second plus first times derivative of the second. Okay. Notice here that this is the partial with uh, this partial of the lo uh, the likelihood function squared over the likelihood function quantity squared. If I pull out the quantity part, we're going to get the log the partial of the log likelihood function squared. Right? Just think about breaking it into pieces. It's partial over log likelihood function, and we said that that was the derivative of the log. Look, it's right above here, okay? So we've done it times itself. All right. So we've got that first part. We can pop out the negative. I'm going to concentrate on the second part. All right. Here's expected value. This is just definition, right? Take the function times the PDF. The one over law, uh, the law, one over likelihood functions cancel each other out. Oh look, I have a support that's free of theta. So I, you know how we were moving parcels in? I was like, move parcels in, and I can move parcels out. Which means that 
I'm taking the partial derivative here of one, right? Because this is now integrating a PDF over its entire sample space. This is a PDF, this is its sample space. So I get one. And of course, we know that the uh, likelihood, excuse me, the partial derivative with respect to theta of one is just zero. So this expected value then is just a zero, which was clipped off on the video on that my screen didn't go, my screen recorder is not going low enough, but I should say equals zero here at the end. So the second part goes away. Okay. So let's look at this and see if we can simplify this even a little bit further. All right, so let me go back here just a second. So we've got this second partial of the log likelihood function is equal to the opposite of the expected value of the partial of the log likelihood squared. The idea here is, is usually it is easier to just take two derivatives in a row than it is to take a partial and square it. That's the idea behind this, by the way. We can simplify it a little bit more. A partial of the log likelihood function, well, the likelihood function is a product of PDFs, right? So I've got log of a product. Oh, wait, that's sum of logs, right? So... And then I can do the sum of expected values. The sum pops out for expected values. But remember that each of these PDFs is the same. All we've done is change the letter, right? So the log of f of x1 of theta is essentially the same as the log of f of x2 theta, or f of x2 theta, and so on down the line. So I might as well just do the expected value of one of these and multiply it by n. Okay, so I just need to take the second, deri the second derivative of the log, likely or the log of the PDF, figure out its expected value, and then multiply it by n. All right, so this now ex this expression now has a name. This is what's referred to as the Fisher information for theta. So i of theta, that is an i. I of theta here is negative n times the expected value of the second derivative of the log of the PDF which is the same as the n times the expected value of the square of the derivative of the P log of the PDF. So we can restate the crowell raymer lower bound inequality then as the, uh, the variance of theta hat is one, uh, greater than or equal to one over the Fisher information. So it's this Fisher information that we're interested in figuring out. All right, let's actually do an example because that was a lot of words. Okay, we know that We've calculated this before. We know that the maximum likelihood estimator of theta for an exponential distribution is just its mean. So it's theta hat is x bar. We've already seen from previous work that we've done is that theta hat is unbiased. That's That was last semester, essentially, or at the beginning of this semester. And it's also sufficient for theta. We've seen that early, uh, earlier in this chapter stuff. So we know that we have an unbiased estimator, which is good. We don't have to worry about correcting for any bias when we do the estimation. And it's sufficient, which means that if we have a, P, if we have a random sample, this particular uh, statistic takes every piece of information that we have from that sample and puts it into information for theta, and that's all we can get out of it. That's what the sufficiency means again. We also know, since this is x bar, we know what the variance of theta hat is. Well, this is central limit theorem. The variance of the sample means is the variance of the distribution, which is theta squared, divided by the sample size. So it's the theta squared over n. So the question is, is this variance as small as we can get it? All right, here's the PDF for the exponential distribution. So let's calculate its Fisher information. So I take the log of the PDF, okay? and take its second derivative. That's how we find the Fisher information. So take the second derivative of the log of the PDF. I'm gonna simplify first, negative log of theta minus x over theta, right? Because the negative is coming from the fact that I got one over theta, and then the, the minus sign in the middle here is because I, I split it up at the, pl uh, the uh, product here and made it a sum, and then log and e undo each other. Okay, you can check my second derivative here. You'll get one over theta squared for the second derivative of negative log theta, and then a minus two x over theta cubed for that second derivative. Now we have to do expected value. Well, here's my function that I need to do the expected value of, right? So expected value of the second partial is this integral, 
We've done expected values. That's a topic from last semester. Let's split it into two integrals. Why wouldn't we? Okay. But the reason why I split it into integrals now is I can also pop out pieces that don't have x's. The 1 over theta squared has no x. The 2 over theta cubed has no x, but the, there is an x left. But the reason why I left this 1 over theta and this 1 over theta is we should now be able to recognize these two integrals. Integrate a PDF over its sample space. This integral is 1. Integrate x times a PDF over its sample space. Hmm. That looks like expected value of x. So I get 1 over theta squared minus 2 over theta cubed expected value of x. Hmm, but this is an exponential distribution. I know what expected value of x is. It's theta. So I simplify and I get to negative 1 over theta squared. So your Fisher information here is theta squared over n and I cut off the bottom. So if I do the reciprocal here of my Fisher information, that's the lower bound of my variances. So we see that the variance of theta hat is equal to the kramer rao lower bound. It's as small as it can get, right? If I do the reciprocal of this, I get theta squared over n. The variance of theta hat is as small as we can possibly get, okay? So that tells us that theta hat must be an MVUE, a minimum variance unbiased estimator for the exponential distribution for the theta, right? We're gonna spend more time doing examples of these in class, I promise, but this is the idea, trying to figure out what this lower bound is and see if the estimator that you have hits that lower bound. If the estimator that you have hits the lower bound, then you know it's a minimum variance unbiased estimator. It's the most efficient estimator that you can find. All right, we'll talk more about this later.